Welcome back, Discovery Learners. Yes, it is I, Teacher Liz, your host once more of a ability to learn. We are getting ever so closer to all Hallow's Eve. Isn't it delightful? Do you know what else is delightful? The live Zoom sessions provided every day by the Discovery Day program teachers. Be sure to tune in and join in on the fun. Today I will bring you another spellbinding adventure through the lands of Africa. Here you will witness their splendor and art and learn about their creatures that go bump in the night. Come along with me my pretties. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Make a Dog's Day Day. National Make a Dog's Day on October 22nd provides the opportunity to give all dogs the best day of their lives. The day not only encourages visits to shelters, it also serves as a reminder to animal lovers everywhere to adopt instead of shopping for a new pet from a pet store. Approximately 3.3 million dogs enter shelters in the United States annually, many being relinquished by their owners. Worse still, approximately 35% of animals that enter shelters are euthanized. That means put to sleep. While numbers continue to decline, the need for adoption continues to be overwhelming. One sure way to make a dog's day is giving them a new, loving home through adoption. Of course, adoption is just one way to make a dog's day. If your favorite canine companion could talk, they might tell us going for an extra long walk would make their day. When was the last time you visited the dog park? Of course, a new chew toy might be on top of their list. Sometimes they just want to play. Another thing that tops the list for fur babies everywhere is to don't stop scratching that itch. So how do you observe make a dog's day? Well, one, of course, visit a shelter, find a loyal canine companion, and make a dog stay through adoption. But if you already have a little poochy friend, take them on a walk, buy them a new chew toy, or even a new bed and blanket. So how do you plan on observing Make a Dog's Day Day? Or do you even have a dog? If you do, what are their names? Leave your answers in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Nut Day. National Nut Day is observed annually on October 22nd. And no, this day is not about the neighbor that lives down the street or the coworker who sings with their headphones on. It is a food holiday celebrating a healthy, nutritious snack. Nuts are a highly prized food, energy source, and a primary source of nutrients for both humans and wildlife. Many of them are used in cooking, eaten raw, sprouted, or roasted as a snack food and pressed for oil that is used in cookery and cosmetics. Fats found in nuts, for most part, are unsaturated fats, including monosaturated fats. Many nuts are excellent source of vitamins E and B2. They are also rich in protein, folate fiber, essential minerals such as magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, copper, and selenium. Nuts are essential to animals, especially those with temperate climates, as they store acorns and other nuts during the autumn months to keep from starving during the late fall, all winter, and early spring. So how do we observe National Nut Day? To celebrate National Nut Day, have a snack consisting of raw nuts during the day. Maybe you snack on some granola nut bars? Stock up on your favorite and bring nutty treats to share with everyone. Top your salads with some nuts or pack them in a bag and munch them during lunchtime or while watching a movie. The possibilities are endless. So what are your favorite kind of nuts, friends? Leave your answers in the comment section below. Another observance for today is National Color Day. National Color Day focuses on the effect of color has on each of us. This observance takes place each year on October 22nd. Color is powerful. It can affect the mood, draw attention, even cause alarm. It is hard to imagine a world without color. Without color, we would nearly be blind. Doctors check for health through color of patient's skin. A flush color in the cheeks of a friend sends a cue of her embarrassment. A streetlight turns on from green, yellow to red. In the Grand Canyon, the layers of sediment range in color from black to pale ash. All these signs alert us to change through color. From the darkened skies before a storm to an undaulting fragile glow of the aurora borealis, 
color in nature moves us to pause and enjoy or to warn us of impending danger. Long before colors had names, they served a purpose. Colors act in our homes and feed our creativity, allowing us to express ourselves. Open a box of crayons or watercolors, and artists of any age lose themselves in a world of their own creation for hours. Different colors are perceived to mean different things. The following is one of the rendition of perceiving meaning of various colors here in the United States. Like red for example means love, yellow means confidence or happiness, green is good taste, envy or relaxation, or means go, blue is cooperate or high quality, pink is sophistication and sincerity, purple sometimes meaning authority or power, brown is ruggedness, black is grief or fear, and white sometimes it means happiness or purity. So how do we observe National Color Day? Express yourself through art. Pick up a paintbrush and make your own interpretation of color in art. Pick an outfit with bright colors. It's all up to you. So what's your favorite color discovery learners? Let me know in the comment section below. Our last observance is International Stuttering Awareness Day. International Stuttering Awareness Day is observed annually on October 22nd. Stuttering is a communication disorder in which repetitions or abnormal stoppages of sound and syllables break the flow of speech. There may be also an unusual facial and body movements associated with speaking. International Stuttering Awareness Day shines a helpful spotlight on stutterers and educates the public on the causes. Usually when people refer to stuttering, they imagine a repetition of a specific word. However, stuttering comes in many forms, including elongation of a vowel or syllable. This condition is so variable, meaning that the severity of the stutter is inconsistent. Some days a person might only stutter a few times, while others the stutter may affect most of their interactions, but lack the understanding of the disorder resulting in years of unfair treatment. Here are some myths associated with stuttering. 1. Nervousness Though it may sound like a person is falling over their words, being nervous is not the main cause of stuttering. Instead of telling people who stutter to take a deep breath, patiently wait for them to get to the end of their sentence without cutting them off. 2. Shyness Shyness may be a cause of stutterers to speak less, but it's not an underlying cause of stuttering. People who stutter might be afraid of judgment, so show them that they can trust you by giving them the same amount of attention you would to those who don't stutter. It's just a habit. Stuttering is a neurological condition. It's not a habit that can easily be broken. Lack of intelligence. There are a lot of smart people that have stutters. Although stuttering is linked to a specific area of the brain, it doesn't affect the person's intelligence. I, for one, have a stutter. I believe I inherited from my father, who had it way worse than I did. And yes, with stuttering comes a lot of discrimination. People do tend to make you feel not so smart. Some of you may also hear my stutter or my lisp in some of the episodes of Ability to Learn. Although I record and I edit some of them out, some of them do shine through. And no, I'm not nervous, I'm definitely not shy, and I'm super smart. And I still stutter from time to time. But I guess I can say the best way to observe International Stuttering Awareness Day is if you encounter someone that stutters, be patient. Allow them enough time to get through to the end of the sentence. Don't finish the sentence for them and do not make fun of them. If you have a stutter, what helped me personally was speaking more often. If you need to repeat yourself, go ahead and do so as many times as you need to to get your message across. So how do you plan on observing International Stuttering Awareness Day? Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1879, Thomas Edison perfects a carbonized cotton filament light bulb. Thomas Edison, an American inventor, perfected the first commercially practical incandescent light bulb using a filament of carbonized cotton thread. His first attempt in his design resulted in a bulb that lasts about 13 hours before burning out. He later extends the life of the bulb up to 40 hours. Edison's successful design came only after he had tested over 6,000 different vegetable fibers during a span of 18 months, running 1,200 experiments, and spending over $40,000. Back in 1879, $40,000 would equal $900,000 today. Wow, that's a lot. 
Today, in 1907, Ringling Brothers' Greatest Show on Earth buys Barnum & Bailey Circus. Both the Ringling Brothers' World's Greatest Shows and Barnum & Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth were American traveling circuses. The Ringlings purchased the Barnum & Bailey Greatest Show on Earth in 1907 and ran the circuses separately until 1919. By that time, Charles Edward Ringling and John Nicholas Ringling were the only remaining brothers of the five who founded the circus. They decided it was too difficult to run the two circuses independently, and on March 29, 1919, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey combined shows. Debuted in New York City, the posters declared the Ringling Brothers World Greatest Shows and Barnum and & Bailey Greatest Show on Earth are now combined into a record-breaking giant of all exhibitions. Charles E. Ringling died in 1926, but the circus continued to flourish through the Roaring Twenties. Later on the next year, John Ringling had the circus move its headquarters to Sarasota, Florida in 1927. As an adult, I no longer go to the circus. But growing up, whenever I heard the word circus, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey were the ones I would think about. Have you been to the circus before? Did you like it? Let me know in the comment section below. Today, in 1979, Disney World received its 100 millionth guest. The Walt Disney World Resort is the world's most visited entertainment resort located in Lake Buena Vista, Florida. The resort includes four theme parks two water parks, and 23 on-site themed resort hotels, a campground, two spas, physical fitness centers, five golf courses, and other recreational venues and entertainment. The resort, then containing only the Magic Kingdom theme park opening October 1st, 1971, has only grown since then. Some of these additions include Disney World, Hollywood Studios, and Disney's Animal Kingdom. On this day in October 22nd, 1979, Mickey Mouse welcomed the 100 millionth visitor, the then 8-year-old Kurt Miller from Kingsville, Maryland, to Walt Disney World in Florida. Kurt Miller received a lifetime pass from Mickey Mouse and Walt Disney World Vice President Bob Allen. Wow, that's pretty cool. He gets to go to Disneyland for the rest of his life for free. Have you ever been to Disney World in Florida, Discovery Learners? If you have, let me know in the comment section below. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is Jeff Goldblum. Born October 22, 1952 in West Homestead, Pennsylvania. This American actor is most famous for starring in the Jurassic Park film franchise. He also had major roles in The Big Chill, The Fly, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and even starred alongside Will Smith in the summer box office hit, Independence Day. Most recently, he assumed the role of Grandmaster in Thor Ragnarok. He turns 68 years old today. Happy birthday, Jeff! Our next notable figure is Christopher Lloyd, born October 22, 1938, in Stamford, Connecticut. This American actor is best well known for playing the zany character from Taxi, Reverend, the sinister character, the judge from the Who Framed Roger Rabbit movie, the electrifying Uncle Fester from the Addams Family movies, and most famously known for playing Doc Brown in Back to the Future series. His acting has earned him an Independent Spirit Award and multiple Primetime Emmy Awards as well as nominations for Saturn Awards and Daytime Emmy Award. He turns 82 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Christopher! Our last notable figure of the day is Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Born October 22, 1975 in Missoula, Montana. This American actor stars as Mitchell on the hilarious sitcom Modern Family, which has earned him five Emmy nominations. Previously, he was on the CBS show The Class. He also provided his voice for the 2016 animated film Ice Age Collision Course. He turns 45 years old today. Happy birthday, Jesse! Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. Today, as we continue our journey of discovery throughout Ivory Coast, here are some national landmarks you should see. Starting off with 
the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace. It is a Catholic minor basilica dedicated to Our Lady of Peace located in the city of Yamasakuro, the administrative capital of Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast. The basilica was constructed between 1985 and 1989. The designs of the dome encircle a plaza are clearly inspired by Basilica of St. Peter in Vatican City, although it is not an outright replica. The Guinness Book of World Records lists it as the largest church in the world, having surpassed the previous record holder St. Peter's Basilica upon completion. It has a total area of 320,000 square feet, and it reaches 518 feet at its highest point. The church can accommodate up to 18,000 worshippers compared to 60,000 at 6-0 for St. Peter's, but it's still remarkable to look at nonetheless. The next landmark to see is the La Cascade Waterfall. It's one of the loveliest waterfalls located in the town of Man, Ivory Coast. The river carves a path through bamboo forests and coffee plantations. It's also littered with butterflies and dragonflies. The spritz of the water makes the air cool and refreshing. In midst of craggy mountains on both sides, this waterfall is a jewel in the sea. Being an exploring mountain range for mountaineers these days, La Cascade is also a great place to swim, except for the dry season which is from July to October. Our next landmark is inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Thai National Park covers a total area of 2,000 square miles. It contains the largest area of primary tropical rainforest of Africa. It lies between the rivers of Calvary and Sassandra. The rich flora and fauna of the forest has a wide variety making it a unique among the animal lovers. While being a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, it also houses many red list threatened species such as the pygmy hippopotamus, olive colobus monkeys, leopards, chimpanzees, and the Genting Steel Cur, just to name a few. Our last landmark for today is La Pyramid. La Pyramid is a high-rise building located in the Plateau area of Abidjan, the largest city in the Ivory Coast. Construction on the building began in 1968 and was completed in 1973. It was designed by Italian architect Rinaldo Oliveri, who aimed to capture the activity of an African market in an urban setting. It is one of the most famous buildings in Abidjan for its distinctive architecture and for being one of the first high-rise buildings built in the plateau area at the time of the Iberian Miracle. The ground floor has spaces for boutiques and shops. With its insufficient ratio of rentable space to circulation, the building deteriorated considerably from the 1990s and became dangerous during the 2000s. A program for complete renovation of La Pyramid was announced by the Ivorian government in 2011 through an offer of public-private partnership. The cost of the renovation is expected to be around 18 billion CFA francs and aims to make the pyramid a tourist attraction. The Ivory Coast is a rather large country with lots to see, but not enough time to cover it all. So what do you think of the Ivory Coast landmarks? Leave your answers in the comment section below. Here's the animal of the day. Today's animal is the African reed frog. Reed frogs are amphibious predators of their size and take impressive leaps to catch their prey. Males are territorial and vocalize loudly to defend their favorite perch from competition, using yet a different bolsterous call to attract a mate. They are agile, fast, active beyond that of your average pet amphibian. Also known occasionally as sledge or bush frogs, African reed frogs are composed of mainly three genera within the family of Hyperoleidae, one being the Madagascar reed frog, the African reed frog, and the banana reed frog. All are very teeny tiny, small amphibians, with some species maturing less than an inch in length, and very few reaching more than 1.5 inches. In other words, they're really tiny, tiny little frogs. No bigger than the tip of your index finger. And I think they're really cute. The Hyperolia species are the most common. In other words, the African reed frog. They range throughout the bushland, savanna, and forest in sub-Saharan Africa. Describing these reed frogs are hard because they come in so many colors and patterns. They have so many different common names based on what they look like and where they live. Despite the differences in colors and patterns, all reed frogs share certain features. They all have slender bodies, 
no noticeable neck separating their short head from the body, two large eyes, and thin legs. These tiny frogs usually eat insects or spiders. Another thing to know about this frog is, unlike most frogs that hide during the daytime, some of the reed frogs sit out in the open. Often, the frogs that sit out in plain view are those that are brightly colored. Colors may be a warning sign to predators that these frogs are not to be eaten because they have poisonous skin. Yikes. So what do you think of these tiny little poisonous frogs, discovery learners? Let your answers be known in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the okra or okro, known in many English-speaking countries as ladies' fingers. It's a flowering plant in the mallow family. It is valued for its edible green seed pods. The geographical origin of okra is disputed, with supporters of West African, Ethiopian, and South Asian origins. The plant is cultivated in tropical and subtropical and warm temperate regions around the world. Some of you may recall the observance I covered of National Gumbo Day. We learned that okra was the main ingredient for that dish. Okra is a perennial species, often cultivated as an annual in temperate climates, often growing up to 2 meters or 6 feet tall. This plant is closely related to other species such as cotton, cocoa, and hibiscus. The leaves can get as long as 3 to 8 inches long and broad. Okra is cultivated throughout the tropical and warm temperate regions of the world for its fibrous fruits or pods containing brown, white seeds. Okra is also available in two varieties, green and red. Red okra carries the same flavor as more popular green okra and differs only in color. When cooked, red okra pods turn green. Okra is used in many dishes and foods around the world. And like I mentioned earlier, it's one of the main ingredients in gumbo. I for one do not like okra in my gumbo. I feel its texture throws off the dish. But that's just my personal opinion. Have you tried okra? Do you like it? Do you eat it in your gumbo? Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is poisonous. It also has three meanings. It's an adjective. First, of a substance or plant causing or capable of causing death or illness if taken into the body. Second, of an animal producing poison as a means of attacking enemies or prey. Venomous. Three, extremely unpleasant or malicious. Poisonous. Let's take a look at the art of the day. This work of art is the African tribal mask. Traditional African tribal masks play an important role in certain traditional African rituals and ceremonies with various purposes like ensuring a good harvest, addressing tribal needs in time of peace or war, or conveying spiritual presence in imitation rituals or burial ceremonies. Some masks represent spirits of deceased ancestors. Others symbolize totem animals, creatures important to certain family or groups. In some cultures like Kuba culture of Zaire, masks represent specific figures in the tribal mythology, like a king or a rival to the ruler. African tribal masks are usually shaped after a human face or some animal's muzzle, albeit rendered in sometimes a highly abstract form. The inherent lack of realism in African masks and African art in general is justified by the fact that most African cultures clearly distinguish the essence of a subject from its looks, being an actual subject of artistic representation. An extreme example is given by the Nawate mask of the Bawa people of Bariska Fosco that represents the flying spirits of the forest. Since these spirits are deemed to be invisible, the corresponding masks are shaped after abstract, purely geometrical forms. The most commonly used material for these masks is wood, although a wide variety of other elements can be used, including light stones such as cetite, materials such as copper or bronze, different types of fabric, pottery, seashells, and more. Some masks are painted with a bright, wide range of colors. A wide array of ornamental items can be applied to the mask surface. Examples include animal hair, horns, teeth, seeds, straw, eggshell, and feathers. The general structure of the mask varies depending on its intended way to be worn and the creator or artist's vision. 
Wow, some of these masks look really cool. And there's another holiday within this month where we wear masks here at home. Can you think of the holiday that's coming up? Let me know in the comment section below. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that the term trick or treat first appeared in print in 1927 in Canada? It's true. In the early 20th century, as immigrants made their way to the United States, bringing along their traditions for certain holidays like Halloween. And before they were called trick or treaters, they were called solars or geysers. They were called geysers because the kids were expected to put on a guise or disguise, which were the early versions of costumes. This was meant to scare off evil spirits, witches, and devils. And before they used to say trick or treat, the trick or treaters or geysers back then would have to sing a song in order to receive a treat in return. The treats weren't candy back then. After singing a song, the trick or treaters would receive a soul cake seasonal baked goods, fruits and nuts, sometimes money and coins. If no treat was given, the trick-or-treaters or geysers would play a trick on the homeowner's house. Essentially, they would either egg the house or in recent times throw toilet paper or silly string. In other words, forms of mischief through vandalism. Hence coining the term trick or treat. The term trick or treat didn't gain popularity until the 1950s. But to be honest, I can't imagine saying anything else when going out collecting candy on Halloween. So yeah, the term trick or treat started in 1920s. Pretty interesting, huh? Okay everyone, set your timers and watches because it's time for 60 seconds of science. Today, in 60 seconds of science, we'll be going over the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a long, fragile, tube-like structure that begins at the end of the brainstem and continues almost down to the bottom of the spine. The spinal cord consists of nerves that carry incoming and outgoing messages to the brain and the rest of the body. It is also the center of reflexes, such as the knee-jerk reflex. Like the brain, the spinal cord is covered by three layers of tissue, meninges. The spinal cord and the meninges are contained in the spinal canal, which runs through the center of the spine. In most adults, the spine composed of 33 individual backbones, or vertebrae. Just as the skull protects the brain, the vertebrae protects the spinal cord. The vertebrae are separated by discs of cartilage, which acts as cushions, reducing forces generated by movements such as walking and jumping. The vertebrae and discs of cartilage extend to the length of the end of the spine. Together, form the spinal column. But that's a lesson for another day, as we are out of time. Be sure to stay tuned all next week for more 60 Seconds of Science on Ability to Learn. Ah, the creatures of the night, what beautiful music they make. We have arrived to the end of the episode of Ability to Learn. I hope you had fun, but not only had fun, but learn something as well. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified when a new video is posted because a video a day keeps the boogeyman away.